episode 129, From Book to Video Game. Welcome to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast, helping micropreneurs find your micro-influencer magic. I'm your host, Candice Rodardi, and this week I'm joined by dark fantasy author, J.V. Hilliard. J.V. is the creator of The Last Keeper and Vorden's Lair, books one and two of the Warminster series, and a partner in launching a blended reality video game based on his books. Welcome, J.V. Do you mind if I call you Joe? You can call me Joe. You want. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. So tell us your unique story. How'd you get to where you are? So, you know, it starts when I was a kid. Uh, My uncle was paralyzed in the war and my mother became his nurse. And when I was very young, uh, I didn't know any different. It was normal. You know, he was my Uncle Joe, right? And uh, I grew up near him by his bedside, mostly before he passed away, complications for his wound. Uh, But, you know, during that time, he was very limited in what he could do. Um, as a quadriplegic. So some of the things he could do professionally were it was obviously right. Uh, and that was a form of escapism for him. And we also played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, another form of escapism for him. Uh, and so I grew up, you know, at his side and emulated him in many respects. He was a second father to me. Uh, and I got a chance to, you know, to understand what he had to do to get out of the situation he was in. And that helped me fall in love with uh, fantasy and sci-fi. Uh, and, um, when I was in the fourth grade, I, my writing was strong enough. I didn't know it at the time, but he did. My writing was strong enough that he entered me into an eighth grade writing class. Uh, and I won, uh, and the day for eighth grade writing competition they, they had, I should say, uh, was one that, uh, when I showed up with my mother as a fourth grader, you could see some eyes looking at me like what had really happened, but I did write it. And I think that was just something that came with a lot of practice and a lot of love. And, you know, that was his form of mentorship for me. And, you know, that's sort of the story that kind of kicked this off and and how I became uh, an author. That's a great backstory. So just briefly, uh, <laughs> was you. it the Vietnam War? Are you that? It you was, know? it was, yeah, he was a Marine uh, and he came back before I was born. Um, but, you know, as I, as I grew up, uh, my, uh, you know, my mother ended up, we, we ended up moving in for a while. And so me and my brother and my mom were there with him, my grandmother and grandfather. So it was kind of like an episode of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory with all the uncles and aunts lying on top of one another in the <laughs> in a really small house. Uh, you know, and uh, I always joke about that, because, but it is true. It was, it was jam packed. And my dad w- worked uh, strange shifts at the mill. Right. So he would be gone from, you know, six at night till two in the morning or midnight shifts and stuff like that. So even though he was around, we really got to see him once every three weeks because he was either up when we were sleeping or at school or he was, you know, or, uh, you know, he was working when we were when we were here. And so it was one of those things. So my uncle, like I said, sort of became a, you know, a father figure to me. And, uh, you know, I had a chance to, you know, learn a lot of things from him, including some that I include in the novel as sort of uh, thematic, uh, you know, and I, I want to make sure that I you know, I, I put this in there, some of the things that he's done, including duty and self-sacrifice. And I think the themes of the, of the novels uh, show some of that. Um, so I've, I've listened to half, I have the, the printed and the audio version of the last keeper. And I've listened to about a half of the last keeper and it really is about family. There's so much family intertwined and, and intermingled in the story. So I can see where that's coming from. I've well, it's been a big part of my, my writing. So yeah, I'm glad you noticed that. Um, there is a, t- a a movie that's out on it's streaming only. I don't think it was ever in the in the theaters, but it stars Ben Affleck as an uncle to a, a, a boy who becomes a famous author. And what you just said just reminded me because they he grew up in the house with grandpa and grandma and the uncle and the aunt and the aunt's kids and and him and his mom. They all live together under one roof. And I think there's a different. That's not the American the way the Americans live these days. Right, but it just seems like so much uh you what's what i'm looking for that you can get so much benefit from surrounding yourself by that many people and having that many positive influences well you're right i mean my um my family is uh is is a crazy american family right i have uh english on one side that came after uh came over the pond after world war ii and i have germans on my other side that came after world war one 
Uh, and so my my holidays and Christmases and things like that were interesting, <laughs> to say the least, you know, in terms of conversations. But, you know, I also think you're right. I mean, I, you know, my my grandfather was was injured and, you know, he d didn't stop him from going to work. He became a, you know, a, you know, a clockmaker and uh, also made Norton bomb sites that went back to Germany and bombed his own country. Uh, and that takes a certain type of person to understand that, you know, you know, he was leaving for all the right reasons. And, you know, on my other side, my other grandfather was was injured, saving a woman from uh, being hit um, by a trolley back in Pittsburgh when we used to have like streetcars uh, and things like that. Uh, you know, he pushed a, a, a woman and her baby out of the way and it nearly blew up his arm and he had this crook in his arm. Uh, but, you know, and so you can see why it was necessary that we all kind of lived together. I mean, he needed help uh, my grandmother eventually um had an alzheimer situation and my mother was a just happened to be a nurse for patients with alzheimer's so it was you know one of these things where it was if it was going to happen to somebody we were in the right place for it you know and i got a chance to you know see a sort of like a you know a second version of a father for that i saw my my dad work in the mills and work his butt off you know for me and my brother and we were the first in our family to go to, to college you know and i was ready to go to air force rotc and my uncle said, look, you know, we've given enough. You're the first in the family to go to college, go to college, you know? And, and so I agree with your, your, your statement, your assertion is, is right on. I mean, I wouldn't know a family any other way and I'm glad it was so close and so big. And I don't, I don't, that doesn't resonate with me at all because my family, my dad was worked for the military and we always lived far away from any family. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Even when we were close to family, we were far away from family. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, no, but I understand. So I, but um, yeah. Um, what it, I, I, you know, I love these interviews, especially with people I've never met before. It's where the conversation goes. <laughs> you know, because I thought we were going to talk about video games. <laughs> well, we can whatever you want. I mean, I, you know, but like in all honesty, it's it, it's something that I uh, I don't mind talking about, and and you know, it, it, I think for for some when they hear that, like you said, what's my backstory? That was the first question you asked. It's you know, it's a tough one. It's a, it's a unique one. And, and I think it's one that's, you know, positioned me uniquely uh, to write the way I write. I've learned a lot and, and you'll see a lot of my human experiences in my fantasy experiences, right? Like you mentioned a few of them already, tight families, uh, very important, you know, love for duty and call to country, you know, and that'll be a theme through all four of the novels through the Warminster series. And then, you know, ultimately, you know, uh, some of the characters are based on people that I know. In fact, I just tweak their names a little bit and they get a kick out of it. It's little Easter eggs I've left uh, in the novels for them. And they recognize themselves and have that, that, that moment where like, oh my God, he's writing about me, you know, and I, and uh, you know, it's just make a little bit of a twist. And all of a sudden you got a fantasy name just like that. You know what I love about that is that you can write, a, you can write your character based on a family member. And what if they don't like it? <laughs> Well, yeah, right. So you have to be careful when it's family members. But I mentioned Dungeons and Dragons earlier, and a lot of the characters in the novel, even though they may not be the same in the book, were named after characters that my friends and family had played over the years. And so they see old character names or old scenarios that have come from, you know, any of the tabletop role playing games we've played. Uh, pop back up, you know, and sometimes it's in a unique way. Other times it's in the exact same way and the way it went down during the campaign. Uh, and so I think that's a lot of fun too. I mean, you get to give that back and, and in a way memorialize, um, you know, in a life experience that you shared with a group, even though it was a imaginative delusional life experience, it sticks with you. And I, I don't know if you've ever played the games before, but you can literally over holidays and, you know, and, and picnics and, and barbecues, you'll be sitting around talking about it. Like it actually happened, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. It just, it sticks with you in a, in a, in a, in a, <laughs> in a way it's hard to describe unless you've been a player before. So I've never played Dungeons and Dragons, although it's very compelling to me. There mm -hmm. are and there are probably a lot of folks listening right now who have never played the game. So could you give a five minute or less synopsis of what the gameplay? And because yeah. you know, I what I understand is that you create your own characters, but I don't. You know, other than that, what else? Yeah. So it's strategy game meets cosplay, right? Is the if I had a like an elevator pitch, that's what it would be. You don't have to dress up like your characters like you would in a cosplay but you do exactly what you described. You're creating a character within the rubric of a game, no rules that they set out. Some of those characters are big and brawny and they fight with swords and shields. Others are 
sneaky and they sneak around and they backstab people and or others are wizards or they're healers and um you can choose whichever class you want to play you can make your character any race you want to play it and so you know you you try to do something that you think is going to be fun and usually if you're playing the game right it lasts like a year or two uh, as you you level up like you would in a video game right so the same things you're doing there you complete a screen or you complete a module and then the next one happens your character is better stronger faster has more power as it goes on to the next and the next and the next um, and the only difference is is there is no game board you know there is no video game to look at you sit around and as a storyteller which is something i think has helped me as an author you have to, one person has to dungeon master meaning you're the one that's setting the scene and um creating the game for those that are playing in it and so whether you're a player character also known as a pc you know a player character plays that one character the dungeon master marshals over all the characters through a campaign setting which is basically a story and you have to overcome obstacles there but they're all in your mind nowadays you can go on like we do you know there, there are game systems out there where you can create a map and have it online everybody's looking at it at the same time or in you know the 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 way back days you would have figurines and sit on a map and people would sit around a big table now you can play from anywhere anytime you can have people from different countries playing with you uh and i think what makes it so unique is it allows folks to you find that level of escapism, escapism I mentioned before. You sneak out of yourself and then you can become somebody else for six hours, four hours, how many of our hours it is. And then the game starts and stops. It doesn't end like a game of Parcheesi or chess where you shut it down. You you can come back to it and you start up where you left off. So I hope that helps. That does help. Uh, okay. I, I am a video game player. Um, not oh, you get as, it then. not so much now that, that as you know before but i have a persona online and there are people who only know me by that name and I, so i think it's the kind of the same thing well you know you know it's not, in very rare instances people uh from way back in the day when things were a little different than they are now there are i have facebook friends who only know me by one name but i'm but now they know my real name right right <laughs> you, you know um but i the the more time goes by the less i would think that i would share my real identity with the people that i play with yeah right? it's, it's weird how that's happened right where like in, in in the beginning it was like hey let's share this and now all of a sudden it's like whoa you know you see all the the craziness has happened because of social media uh and you can hide behind these i know people that have like 30 40 of these different things and they that like literally in, in my business it's not uncommon and you'll see the you know the the marketing aspect of this uh, a lot of authors write many different things they're just out of genre for them so where i am a fantasy adventure author people that read fantasy adventure hopefully will get to know my name but if i decided that i wanted to write romance the jv hilliard name might not translate to the romance category so well so we often create nom de plumes right where we've got these pen names that are specific to the genre in which we're writing so you know that way you can market it better and sometimes you choose those names so that you you're better marketed within uh the genre so it works on my side of the table for folks that are choosing pen names to do it it wouldn't surprise me that others especially those that are in social media and on uh, and online where they, they're trying to protect their true identity and they just assume something else just very much like an actor would take a stage name uh, Stephen King wrote Running Man, but he wrote it under a pseudonym because Running Man really isn't his genre. That's it's right. a great story. Yeah. So think, his, yeah. Yeah. Think of Stephen King writing a, a romance novel. You know what I mean? And the truth is, is he, he might have just under a different name. Yeah. I've got a I've got a, a friend of mine whose name is Simon King and Simon writes uh, prison stories and thrillers and suspense. But he's also writing under a female pen name uh a romance series you know and like you just <laughs> you know it's just you have to do what you got to do and it's just the way that you you have to, to advertise it because Stephen King was writing a romance people wouldn't buy it for the romance they would buy it because it was Stephen King you know but you want to read what you think is you know and, and the same thing goes with the covers of the book your your covers have to to scream your genre it's got to scream out to someone that will read your stuff or else they pass it by well I think that Stephen King has a little more leniency because of his he can do whatever he who, yeah he can do it because uh the, the 1962 i think was the name of the book without the murder of um kennedy 68 i can't remember or it was a date maybe the name of the book was a date but that was completely out of his wheelhouse but it was 
a really compelling story. Yeah. Yeah. And he's uh, the top of the list, so he can do pretty much whatever he, he, wants, whatever he wants. People buy his stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of top of the list, because, you know, Ben Affleck is at the top of the list. No. Uh, the the movie that I was referring to it earlier was is The Tender Bar. Uh, and it's a really nice story. Um, I highly recommend the movie. I can't remember. I'll have, I'll have uh, to check it out. Yeah, I can't remember if it's on YouTube. Not YouTube. Um, it's probably on Amazon Prime because that's what what I have mostly. Amazon Prime. Okay. Anyway, Tender Bar. It's about a guy who owns a bar and his, un- his and his nephew. And it's just a really, um, it's a really great story about family. So, um, I, since we talked about the movie, I wanted to make sure that the title of the movie was shared. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, so let's talk about your book, The Last Keeper. Yeah, yeah. When I, there are um, characters that are familiar. Elves, centaurs. Wait, hold on. Have there been centaurs yet? Trolls. <laughs> are mm-hmm. there centaurs? Did I miss? Is, am I wrong? <laughs> no, there's not centaurs. Yeah. <laughs> but you've got uh, tro- half troll, half elf, half you know, you've got all these familiar characters, but your um, your landscape and your storyline are so unique. So tell me about your, I mean, you've already told, shared the inspiration for the story, but I mean, you have a map of your, of your, you have, it's, you've created an entire world. And I can understand where Dungeons and Dragons led to that, but now it's leaning, it's leading you on another journey towards creating a video game. So Share that. I mean, share that whole process. Share that. Just yeah, sure. So as I it. mentioned, yeah, no, as I mentioned earlier, a, a lot of what I started writing was epic fantasy. And when you when you write epic fantasy, you have to pull and borrow from those that did it best. And you take a look at the J.R.R. Tolkien's of the world or the George Martin's of the world with Game of Thrones. They world build, right? And there are things in there that are unique, but there's also things in there like magic and swords and sorcery and dragons that are ubiquitous to the genre. You know, so I chose a few things that may be ubiquitous and gave them my own personal spin. So my elves are not really Tolkien elves or they're not Dungeons and Dragon elves, but they're Vermilion elves or Raven elves or Dale elves. And they all have a specific, you know, abilities that they have from being from different areas of, of the realm. But I also think that if you if you look at those masters, they've all created maps, they've all created glossaries, they've all created backstories. And I think fans of epic fantasy like to see that kind of stuff they like to see you know maps and details and so if you go to my website um you'll be able to see not just the map of the the realm but then you can also dig deeper into the stories of the various families the houses the royalty the nobility and in books two and beyond we're also going to have family trees and a glossary of of terms that allow people to pick up where they left off and remember those things because as you mentioned there's a lot of names in my book, you know, epic fantasy. Uh, you have a tendency to do that because you're talking about someone's grandfather and then their father and then the main character. And so there's a lot of uh, you can dig deep. And I think, you know, fans, again, uh, expect that kind of stuff. And that's where that really started from. Uh, but to your other part of the question, you know, I was approached about six months ago uh, by a, a video game company uh, called Melderverse. And Melderverse takes its name from two two properties. One is it's a metaverse company, which is becoming more and more uh, relevant as uh, Web 3.0 gets closer and closer to really being reality. Uh, And then secondly, the meld part, you know, comes in in where he's melding metaverses together. And one of the things he wanted to do was to create a video game that would include stuff that you can do on your computer or a Pokemon Go aspect or a Harry Potter aspect of augmented reality. And then the video stuff that you would find with Oculus or other headset devices and make a blended reality game. So you could play it at any stage, whether you're sitting in front of your computer, you're sitting in, you know, or you're, you're out at a, at a restaurant or you're, you know, you're, you've, you're in your game den with your headset on, you can play any and all aspects of it in, in all those ways. And what he was looking for was a realm that he could license uh, and one that uh, would lend itself to, um, you know, one of these games that are going to go on beyond one single game. They're always going to have updates. And so when he found me, he had asked me, you know, would I be interested in licensing the game? And at the time I was just on book one, but now that we see book four, he's got literally four generations of the realm of Warminster and then beyond to do that. And there's plenty of characters in there for your avatars to meet while they're, they're in the game. 
Uh, and there's also, you know, plenty of, of uh, quests uh, to complete and treasures to be won. And, and you follow along the basic plot lines of the novels, not exactly to the word, uh, but, you know, it's it's a video game in its first stage. And, you know, I'm, I think I might be the first author to have that. I'm not I'm not sure. If not first, I'll be one of the first to have this sort of blended reality game. And he expects that alpha to be done sometime uh, this uh, in Q4, maybe around December of 2022. Uh, and so he's going through proof of concept right now, including uh, testing of a uh, of that proof of concept. And then beyond that. We'll go to a beta and then sometime 2023 uh mid to late 2023 we'll actually see the first run on the of the video game there so we're about a year away but you know it was something i didn't expect uh we had never seen coming and bang right there and i was like yeah and so to your point i was able to take all that stuff i put together just to add meat to the bone of the story and it turned into a, a business opportunity immediately i started thinking about um jk rowling and harry potter and the Harry Potter movies versus the Harry Potter books. And they started making those movies before she was done writing the series. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as they made the movies, they had to make sure that they didn't do anything in the movies that would, you know, prevent, you know, that would change the outcome of the books. So I can see that what you're doing is similar. You've got four stories already written, which and, and one game written and then the iterations of the next games are going to come out in order i guess yep. and so you could just keep going i mean you don't know where the story can is going to end because you can just keep developing and developing and spin uh, off yeah i think that, that i can answer that question in two ways i mean from an authorship perspective uh yeah i mean you you, you even though i want the series to end and have some finality to it you know, if it's popular and if people like it, my hope is that the characters grow beyond that and we can either do backstories and origin stories or we can do the next set of them, right? Like Star Wars started at book four and, you know, and then jumped back to the pre the prequels and then, you know, the, the, you know, finished up here and it's still going on. We, we won't spent. talk about those prequels. <laughs> Where, I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. I mean, I, I, it's, it's like the Highlander movies after the first one, I'm not sure they ever existed. Uh, all, I think we can all, uh, you know, agree to that, but the, um, yeah. yeah. So in, in this case, you know, with, I think the benefit that Melderverse has in uh, adopting this as a, as a blended reality game is there's so much material there that even if I'm not there, they can do stuff in other parts of the realm. Um, uh, you know, even if you took a look at that map, you'll only see it's, it's, you know, in book one, I only really cover a third maybe a quarter of the map there's other things going on in other parts that we if we needed to jump into we could and develop those out in concurrence with the novels or we can develop them independent of the novels there's a variety of ways we can skin that cat and i think that you know we're just in the beginning the nascent stages of it so it would be a good problem to have if we get there you know but you know right now i'm just i'm hoping that the, the first game is successful so as a marketer i'm my brain is already on fire I have a friend, uh, Diana Bots Botsford. She was one of my very first podcast interviews. So there will be a link to that interview in the show notes, listener. Um, so Diana writes tie-in novels for Stargate. Oh, cool. And I, and you know, I've consumed, you know, I don't know if you can tell or not, but you know, I have a little bit of an affinity for some Star Wars, Rogue One, I, hashtag Rogue One. <laughs> yeah, but, um, just a little. I, yeah, I uh, really enjoyed listening to the tie-in novels. I, I would listen to the, the story. My husband and I would listen to the books when we were taking road trips or whatever. Uh, and we got really invested in these characters, Jason and Jaina Solo, who don't exist in the movies. Yeah. And, well, they wrote know, the soul. Yeah. The, the, the solo kids, they wrote them. It's, they're no longer canon. I don't, I don't know how that, I don't know how you do that. They were good novels too. They, they, uh, Jay, Jaina Solo could star in 10 movies. She's such a good character. But mm -hmm. we're just, you know, that's a completely different, different conversation. Anyway, um, <laughs> all of those novels are written by different authors. That's right. Right. Yeah. So you could be the George Lucas of this video game, right? You could be the man who created well, the, you... <laughs> <laughs> you well, created I'll tell you the universe and other people could take it and you could yeah. get paid, you know, a residual from them taking your universe and writing stories. Well, yeah, technically your marketing mind has it correct. Right now, um, at the starting line, I haven't even left the gate, but uh, you're not you're, thinking big enough, Joe. Yeah, you're remember, not thinking but, big enough. But in my head, I think big. So like I've had people contact me about writing fan fiction. 
as weird as that might sound, it's a debut novel from a debut author. Uh, and I've had people ask me about certain characters and you have to kind of say, look, I can't stop you from writing fan fiction, but I would prefer that you at least let me get through the first series <laughs> so that you can find out what happens to those characters. Uh, but I've had people ask me for backstories on some of the minor characters, people that I didn't expect that they'd asked me for that could be small novellas. And in the same way that like Timothy Zahn is writing the, the Thrawn stuff for Star Wars or Salvatore, you know, wrote the book, you know, that, you know, where Chewbacca, I don't want to be a, if you haven't read them, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be a spoiler alert for you, but you know, there you're right. You've got these other authors that do that. And I mean, in a grand scheme, sure, that would be a perfect way to kind of marry them up and have folks do that. But I also think just the inspiration you get from people that contact you, that give you ideas and they're honest. They're like, why, why did you do this to this character? Or I don't understand why this happens. And I found myself finally on the opposite side of the table. It was like when Daenerys Targaryen turned bad, you know, in, in, uh, you know, Game of Thrones, you're like, how did that happen? How did you let that happen? And it's the same thing in a much smaller way. I get a couple of emails, not millions, uh, like I'm sure the show got, um, you know, or Martin himself got. So like, there's a lot of that kind of stuff that I think is, um, you know, uh, possible. And let's just see how far this goes. I was just humbled to have the opportunity to to, to look at licensing it for a video game. Because in all honesty, it's its own business. You know, one of the things I found out is um, being an author is your own business. You, you are the brand and your books are the product. Uh, and as you continue to build out your, pro your product suite, it's much like owning a like I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years uh, doing other things. And when I started this, I started to apply those entrepreneurial techniques to being an author. And so there are, there are, there are things out there that I didn't think I was going to get into. And first, when I was doing this, I was like, I had some downtime over COVID and my wife looked at me and she was like, what are you going to do? You're not going to sit in the house. Right. So I literally just sat there and started typing and I wrote it, um, you know, and then everything else was kind of born from that. Uh, and now it's like a second business. It's like, it, it's a, it's not a sidecar. It's not a hobby. If you want to be successful at it, you got to go out there and you got to hit conventions and you got to, you know, to be on social media and you have to, you know, do what things that you can do to market and advertise your book. And you got to do podcasts like this and, you know, spread the word and get people to listen to you and listen to the story and, or like the author and then, you know, follow along and, and see if they like the books. That is so true. What else did you, from your from being an entrepreneur, what else did you learn from being an entrepreneur that you applied to your author business? Yeah, sure. So a couple of things. first of all, I didn't know much about being an author until about three years ago. And it was a crash course, right? I took this novel that I put together and I gave it to a friend of mine uh, who is a professor to read. And she said, you know, this is publishable. Uh, but you're going to need a development editor and you're going to need a copy editor. And then you're going to need someone to design your cover. And then you should really think about having someone who knows how to write blurbs, write a blurb for you. And then you got to find a publisher or you can publish it yourself. And then you've got to figure out ways to, you know, do rapid release, which I didn't even know what that meant to me. Rapid release was an aspirin. And what it really turns out to be is in this grand new form of independent authorship, when you get to Amazon, there's an expectation that, that readers don't want to wait a year for the next book. They want something in the next month or at worst, the next quarter. And when you write epic fantasy, that's hard to do. You know, so you have to find the right publisher um, as part of that, someone that's going to work with you. And then you have to negotiate royalties, you know, and some of the big houses won't even look at folks like me because we don't have a following yet. So you start to build your YouTube followers. You start to build, build your Twitter followers to make yourself relevant so that these bigger houses will come by and potentially buy your contract out from a smaller publisher or you make a decision on whether or not you want to go indie and do all this stuff yourself uh and then it's all you and it's out of your pocket uh and it's how much you want to invest in it and that's the kind of thing i learned is it's just it's a it's a balancing act there are things that my publisher will do and then there's things she won't do you know and if i want those other things i've got to do them for myself and that's out of my pocket i'm investing in my business in the same way that I would invest in any other business. It's, it's sunk capital. Uh, and in many ways, um, you know, depending on what you do, you, you can fail at it, right? You, there, are, there are times where in something you've invested in doesn't go as well as you think, and you expected a different outcome. And other times where the, the smallest of things make a difference, right? And so you'll learn from your mistakes and make it better next time. And so what I've done is I've created my own budget. You know, I work with my publisher on hers. 
know, I want to make sure that that you know I am doing my best outreach as possible for marketing my book. So I'm doing the podcast circuit. I'm going to the conventions. I'm doing the library circuit, the bookstore circuit, anything I can do to to promote myself. And like at an event, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, there were two people at it. You know, three if you count the librarian. And um, hey, you know, that's three more people that have my book that didn't have it before. Was it the best use of my time? No, but it was the right use of my time. It felt good. And those people bought the book and those people are going to read the book and they're going to tell other people about it. And, you know, and that's the kind of thing you just, you have to learn to play in this space. And that's what I've been spending the last year doing is becoming a better businessman within my authorship. That those two people may know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody that leads to something else. That's exactly right. You know, they, they told me, uh, the woman that was there, uh, told me that, you know, her, her son works at Twitter, you know, and he know he's in San Francisco and there's a lot of things like he knows people. And the second woman came to me and wants to be part of my writing group. She shared with me her stuff and she should be a writer. There's no doubt. I mean, she has the chops to make it happen. And so I referred her to other people that can help her become a writer. And because she was writing fantasy, even though it was more YA than, than, than epic or dark, you know, I, I can help her to some degree. And sometimes those things, you, you never know, right? Networking is a big part of any, I would not have gotten this chance to do the video game. If it wasn't for networking, right? It was a guy that came to one, it was 20 people at a library and he showed up that night and said, this is really cool. This is exactly what I'm looking for. I found you. We live in the same city. Let's go and, and do this. And he convinced me to, to take a look at the business model. And I shared it with my IP lawyer and we're like, all right, this is the way, if you can do it this way, we're, we're in. And in the last couple of months, it's worked itself out. And now we're off to the races. So as a marketing coach, I teach my clients that the most important thing that you can do is network. And you just reiterated. I mean, you never would have met that guy from Metaver- Meldiverse if you hadn't have gone to that event with 20 people. That's right. Right. And did I make a, no, I made 400 bucks at that event. You know what I mean? But the point was, uh, you know, I made a lot more based on him showing up and then it's people that around him. Uh, my voiceover actor for my audiobook is we're working together on a separate project. I've got him in, he's going to be the voice talent for the video game. And, you know, it just, you know, just knowing other authors, they've got other advice. You have to listen and you're building your community. And in the beginning, you just have to look at it as this is my downtime. This is my business. This is where I'm spending my, my, my own human capital. This is where I'm spending my own, you know, true capital. And, you know, eventually when you get to that third or fourth book, that's when you're hoping it like the hockey curve, you know, happens and, and, and you take off. Uh, but, well, and you know, the more you attend the cons and the and the, and the those kinds of events, those big conventions, the more um, the more the people who run the conventions get to know you. Especially if you're going to the smaller ones, uh, mm-hmm. in the in the big ones you could get lost, but in the smaller ones, that's where the magic happens. And I'm saying this from a person who has attended big cons and little cons and and been a vendor at big cons and little cons. So um, actually, I've never been a vendor at a big con, just little cons. Um, but you you do you meet the other vendors, you meet the other um, you meet the the showrunners, you meet the different people. And at those smaller events, you don't know what the connection is that you're going to, you know, you, you don't know. Like what, at one event, we were in a booth next door to a couple of people who ran a really big convention and they just happened to have, also have a product that they sold. And that was a really good connection. I mean, I met Diana Botsford at a convention uh, and we became friends. So you just don't know, you just don't know um, the value of, attending something unless you actually attend it. And even if you don't make any money, there could be something that comes yeah, from something, it. And, there's and a benefit that comes that, from That it. benefit that you're not going to know if you don't go. Yeah. And I had the exact same thing happen to me. I was at a comic book store for National Comics Day. And I was, there was a very well attended crowd, a very large comic book store. And a guy that was walking out came over to me and said, Hey, you know, I make videos. And do you need a book trailer? And he came over and showed me his Star Trek and his Jurassic Park videos that he had made just as samples. And he's now making my next three video trailers. And that's, you know, and he's a local guy. We got to talking. He's talented. You look at his resume. He's done stuff all over the world. I would not have met him if we weren't comic book geeks together. You know what I mean? And I've had people do, you know, he's actually creating a a figure that's going to be used in 
the book trailer that I got fan fiction done. Someone, not fan fiction, but fan art. Someone drew a character of the antlered man, the, 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 one of the, the the monsters in the book, that they that's what they saw it as. And then he made, he brought that to life. And I connected the two of them. So one guy that does like caricature living and another guy that does movies together. And they're not working together to create the the prop that's going to be used in my book trailer. It's just, you know, that kind of stuff happens. And and sometimes it's like, hey, I'll do this for you. You do this for me. Other times it's it's money exchanged, but it's those friendships that will lead to other contacts. In, in a book, you have other than what's ever on the cover, you just mm-hmm. really, you know, it's your imagination that creates what the character looks like. And so... It's, I think it might be better if a fan creates your artwork because then you know what you've described, right? Exactly right. So you're looking at a cover I had zero to do with, literally. It, I get more compliments on that cover and people think that I designed it. I didn't do anything. I got my uh, copy editor came up with the idea of this you know, sort of heavenly creature with the white eyes, which is Damus Alaric. Um, you know, and with the castle, br- the bridge in the background uh, alongside Ritter, who's standing on the bridge and Ritter's Falcon, you know, and all of a sudden you've got this magical cover. And I went to a cover design artist. Um, her name's Larch Gallagher and Larch uh, is really good at this stuff. I mean, incredibly, you know, adroit at putting these things together. Um, and so I went and I, I talked to, to Larch about doing the cover. And that was her interpretation of his interpretation of my interpretation. And that's what it came from. And, and I, you know, I even laugh. I, I've said this a couple of times on other interviews. I, I one time got a two-star review for my book and they said, I got 50 pages into it. It just wasn't for me. I wanted to, I wanted to love this book because of its cover, but I just couldn't finish it. And what ended up happening was they left me a two-star. But what I read in that critique was the cover did its job. <laughs> so you're exactly right. Absolutely. And you know what? You, n- not everything you do is going to be for everybody. You got to niche. Right. You have right. to niche. And you yeah. have a yeah. niche, you know? That's right. Yeah. And not everybody. And the other thing I learned about this too, and this is a bit of a marketing thing. Um, I don't have to have my friends and family buy my book. You know, sometimes people that buy your book uh, buy it because they know you, they like you, they love you, whatever. They're doing it as a favor. But the people that are my real target audience, I don't know. You know, you have to cater to them and you got to meet them at those conventions. You've got to meet them at the libraries. They're coming to see you at the bookstores, you know, and it's that networking that builds loyalty to the brand. And they're going to come and buy the next and the next and the next because they met me and I spent time talking to them. And we've talked about the characters. We've talked about the plots. They've emailed me or whatever, you know, or contacted me on social media. And I think those are the kind of things uh, that help um with uh well, at least it, from my from my perspective it's helped me as a as a as a new author so my husband and i we really enjoy listening to sci-fi and we a lot of times we listen to it together or he'll listen to you know he'll listen to the story and i'll listen to the story and then we'll talk about it and we <laughs> have a favorite author in the in the sci-fi genre his name is it's joshua dalzell so okay. my husband and i really enjoy have you ever read any of his books joshua dalzell no. okay so he writes sci-fi space opera kind of stuff. Sure. And um, so I engage with him on Facebook. I just, you know, I follow him on Facebook and he's always really open and I'm not, I'm not a Facebook person, so I don't, I'm not on Facebook that much, but he's always very open. He always tells what's going on. He says, this is why the, uh, the next audiobook isn't out yet. He's always really, really candid. And so it makes him a human, right? right. And we know, we know his mm-hmm. story. We know that he was, you know, in the Marines, I mean, in, in, you know, in his real life, we know, know who he is because he puts it out there and that makes him a person, even though I've never met him, I don't, I don't know him. I enjoy his books, but I feel like I know him because of the, the way he engages with his audience. Yeah, right. And that's so important to do as an author. And I'm sure you're doing it too. Well, I I love it. You know, it actually energizes me. Even if people say something that they don't like, it's it's a learning experience, right? Like you 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 pick up or you know, I've had people complain about a variety of things in the book or or you know, the direction that, that I tell them I'm heading. Um, and you, you, you learn from that, right. And you become a better author because of those experiences, but it energizes me when you get out there and someone comes up and they want you to autograph you their book or the, the, you go to a, you know, I went to the, uh, a different comic book thing for, it was a, a role-playing game day, RPG day, just a couple of weeks ago and 70 people 
stopped by to see me that I would not have met. I got every one of their emails. I've already contacted all of them. I'm telling them about the second book that's coming out in August, like all those kind of things. And you just leave there and they're like, they came to see you. Like they're, yeah, sure. They were coming for comics, but they were there and they spent time. They could have easily walked out. They didn't have to talk to me, you know, but I engaged with them where they came up to me. And a lot of these folks too, I think that, you know, authors have a tendency to be very good observers, but also on bulk, we are an introverted group. And I know it's hard for some to flip that switch and go out and even do a podcast like this, where you're talking about stuff. I don't know what you're going to ask and kind of freeze up. You know, for me, you know, I, I, I've never had that problem. If you can't tell, <laughs> I, have a t- I have a tendency to speak what's on my mind, <laughs> you know, at that time. And, um, you know, whatever torpedoes damn them. But like, the, you know, that's the idea here is that, you know, I, you've got to do that. You've got to have that content that, that even if they're coming up and they tell you and, you, and you say, well, you know, I didn't see it that way. I'm, you know, I'm sorry. That's not the way this book goes. At least they've got to say their piece. And, you know, they, they, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you one experience. <laughs> one experience about the video game thing i have to slide this in because it's 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 just exactly what you described so we're at this we we found a D club and there was about 30 maybe 40 people that get to get together like once twice a month and they play at the in the back of this D store very much like you would play like magic the gathering or pokemon or that kind of stuff and we were introducing them to the concept of the blended reality game and i spoke on behalf of the author who is spawning the the metaverse you know, Jay, who's the CEO of the company, spoke on behalf of the technology. And we went through in 10 minutes. We don't interrupt your game, anything like that. Uh, but what do you guys think? And the first person didn't even raise his hand. He said, oh, my God, that's a horrible idea. I'd have to leave my house. <laughs> you know, And you're like, uh, you know, and you realize for us that that split second that you've got the most brutally honest opinion about what you're doing. And we backed them up. We were like, well, wait a minute. You can play this game on a computer. You don't have to leave your house. If you want to collect the tokens that will allow you to do things, you can get things in other places when you visit libraries or you visit a, you know, one of our sponsors or you go to another game store. You'll be able to use a QR code and get it. But, you know, they wanted to see a game that was based around their reality, which was their house, their work, their game, their local game stores or LGSs, right? They didn't want to see it be commercialized. They didn't want to see, hey, you open up a chest in the game and you get a free coupon to Subway. You know, and it, but that's, you know, there's a, there's a trade off there be- between commercial retail and the dollars that come with that versus playing and placating those that like the genre, the game, and in my case, the books. So uh, it was a very interesting experience, but I think you, 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 you drilled it. You drilled right down on it. Tap dead center. So you open a chest and you get a coupon for Subway. There, if you're a gamer, you know, People, people, listener, there's a, a a video game that came out very recently, Diablo Immortal, and it's it made something, some huge number, like $12 million in its first month or so. I mean, some ab- absurd number. And then some people buying stuff to make their characters, you know, um, level up. But the, the idea of somebody sponsoring the game so that you can play the game and not have to invest your own money it's really appealing. I mean, that's a model that a lot of games use where they're sponsored. You watch a video, you get a prize, right? Kind of thing. I love this idea. Well, yeah, that's the unique aspect of this, right? It's both a game that you can use in real life. So if your character goes and slays the dragon and you recover the treasure chest and you open it up, there's going to be things in the Realm of Warminster video game that will benefit your character. You get a higher level. You get a badge, you get a new skin, you get a new magical weapon that you found there, you get treasure that you can spend in the game, but you also get a chance to take stuff that you find there and spend it in the real world. So if we do get sponsors, which we already have some, the concept is, is you're going to get their customer relation token. It's a form of an NFT that you can redeem when you go to their store. You can redeem it online. You don't have to go to their store, but, you know, and you know they're able to track that traffic because it comes into them and they say, okay, this came from the game. That, that 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 token has that number. And so we know it came from Realm of Warminster. That's how many people we're getting. So they know how much business we're generating from them. We're getting, you know, uh, you know, the licensing from that and some of the, the, the deal agreements that are there. And the people that are playing the game get the benefit of that. So and the idea is to find stuff that of course our members are going to want, like GameStop or 
you know, perhaps, uh, you know, something that for local game stores and things like that, or anybody that's going to redeem things for food or coffee or whatever it might be. So at the national level, you want to target the subways, the Starbucks, the, you know, the sporting goods stores that will give you discounts or freebies. But by the same token, you want to get stuff in the game because you're really playing the game to level up your character and have fun, right? It's an entertainment venue. My mind, uh, there are so many things that could be done with this. I, I mean, big corporations who sell their products through local stores, doing a coupon that gets traffic into a local store. That's a win-win. Mm-hmm. You know, it's sponsored content that'll that'll bring traffic into your favorite comic book store. Wow. Yeah. There's well, so many. You, even, if, even if you leave the cliffhanger, like you kill the dragon and to level up, you have to go to the store. Right. And there's a QR code at the store that you have to go and say, we to complete your quest, now go to your local whatever. You go there and you take your phone and you hold it up and you click on it. And now all of a sudden you completed the quest. And while you're here, here's a free Coke, you know, and a smile. And you also get a discount on a sandwich or the next game, or you get a two for one or, you know, a, B, a BOGO, you know, anything like that. There's a commercial aspect to that that hasn't been tapped into yet that we're trying to tap into for this the relevance to the game i think will, will help uh but i also think that also the, the, the way that this game is being built is that you could have a character leave the realm of warminster and wander into a sci-fi metaverse as well you know that's a little bit further down the road so your realm of warminster character that might be you know a ranger scout with a bow now goes on to starship enterprise or whatever it may, it may end up being and has an adventure there and you can bring stuff back from that you can cross over worlds and things and i think there's going to be an opportunity to do like virtual tailgates for for sports teams and athletics or you know helping people with you know the, the this for like fundraising for walks where you're you're going through a, i know you i can see it happening where you you have a your a juvenile diabetes walk or a walk for you know a cause and people that can't be there are now logging on to Melderverse and they're able to log in and do it in, at their gym and pretend that they're there and raise money for the cause or or as they're going through the walk there are different NFTs that you can pick up as part of this and add it to your wallet based on you accomplishing your first K your second K your fifth K. Uh, as part of that too. There's so many applications for it. And that's what's exciting about Web 3.0. That's what's exciting about the Melderverse. And, I, and I'm, I'm excited to be part of it as an author who's trying to get in on, on the ground floor. You know, they're already doing virtual walking challenges where you um, you go for a walk and you're walking a like the Inca Trail or uh, Athens or the English Channel. You're walking virtually whatever that is. So they're already doing some of these things. Uh, but imagine doing that kind of challenge as your own, as a, as an avatar, you know, that's as, right. As your own avatar, your yeah. character then grabs something off the side of the road. They're, they, they see the ink and trail, but floating there is an NFT when you get to a certain marker and your character can grab that. And then you can wear it as a badge. You could, you could use it to trade with other people in the realm. Hey, I've got three of these. You don't have any, I'll give you one. It could be used to redeem. There's a lot of different ways that you can use these things that we're now working on that are not gonna be part of the first generation game, but likely like 1.2, 1. 1.3. 1. I mean, even if it's 10 years away, it's still the future. I mean, this is this to me sounds like, because how, how much further can a video game go that you play on your computer? I mean, they've just released ways to play a video game both on your computer and a phone and go back and forth and it's seamless, right? That's something that just happened. But that's, I mean, that's freaking boring, right? What you're describing is completely um, uh, immersive and expansive. I mean, there's no limits. I I think, and I I don't mean to pitch him, but you should have Jay on. He's the CEO of Melderverse. You should have him on as a guest. Oh, absolutely. Because he goes even beyond that. Like what he does is he's creating 3D spaces. So imagine like right now your Facebook profile or your Twitter profile is very flat, right? It's 2D. Like you go there and you basically see some videos you post to some, some things you left for your friends. You tag some people in some pictures and that's it. Now in a 3D version of this, you can create your own habitat. So your house could look like a castle. It could be a cave outdoors with your at a campground. It could be whatever you want to make it. And then you decorate it the way you, you want to. And you can spend money decorating it by buying things or accomplishing things in the video game. 
So you can have a trophy case of the stuff that you've done, or you're able to build your own virtual property, like in Minecraft or, you know, um, you know, all the clan games and stuff like that too. And there's just a variety of things that we're not going to see until you get to that point uh, where you get to that web, web 3.0 stuff, but that habitat stuff is it's coming and that'll be the next gen. Um, in my opinion, it'll be the next gen social media aspect of it. You, I can invite you to my virtual tailgate to watch the Pittsburgh Steelers play whoever you can come and visit me in my tailgate. And there's 20 other people there that I don't even know. They just came to my tailgate. We get to know them, you know, and then they, they, you know, some of them are wearing Philadelphia Eagles jerseys, you know, and stuff like that. And you, you eat a virtual beer or drink a virtual beer. And when you do, you now get a, a token that gives you a discount on your next case of Miller light. You know, there's so many cool things that you can run through this uh, and, and you can see how you can get fan engagement. You can get, you know, player engagement and, and how that crosses over into commercialism. The future of capitalism right there. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 God, I don't want to say this, but we need to start thinking about wrapping up. Okay. Oh, so, okay. so I have two questions left. The first one is offer three tips of advice for somebody who is thinking about being an author who wants to become an author. Sure. So advice point number one, make it muscle memory that you have to write. One of the things that I find is if you let it slip, it goes away. It's like missing the gym. And the day you miss the gym and you actually feel like you're guilty about it, that's what you need to be about your writing. And it doesn't have to be expansive. You don't have to knock out three chapters, but you have to write, make it a thing you do every day. It's a habit. And even if you're outlining another project or you're you're just tackling part of a chapter, at least you're through that. Secondly, get good beta readers. And what I mean by that is, you know, for those of you who don't know what a beta reader is, a beta reader is someone that goes to see a movie preview before it's out and they choose the ending, right? They, they, they help you decide which, which movie was better. And then the movie company picks that one to run with because of the response they got. Same thing with beta readers, except for the fact they're seeing holes in your product before you go to market with it. And they're gonna tell you, well, I don't understand why these two characters don't like one another, or there's this whole thing that's missing and you're too close to it to see it. And someone who understands your genre, likes the way you write and can offer honest, constructive criticism, that's what you're looking for in terms of getting a group like that. And it doesn't have to be someone's another author. It can be someone that's, a. I, I would recommend they're a fellow creative, somebody that, is open-minded enough that they can look at what you're writing and get into it and say, I can see why I'm in Joe's mind or I'm in Candace's mind. And this is what she's thinking. This is what he's thinking. And how do I help them make this better? You know, and they're going to throw out crazy ideas. 80% of them you're going to not agree with, but that 20% becomes nuggets of gold that you can then take back and put into your, uh, into your final product. And number three, and I've mentioned it sort of tangentially there, be open to constructive criticism. A lot of people are afraid to share their work. You're only, uh, iron sharpens iron, right? It's the old, you know, mantra. You have to be able to share work with people that are can, in positions that can be credibly critiquing it. So you can share it with your mom and she's going to say, oh, it's the greatest thing I've ever read. Of course she is. That's not who you need. That's not the critique you need. That you know, you need someone to go out there and say, well, I would rank this a three out of five stars and it could be better if you did A, B, and C and you learn from that. So, you know, make it a habit, share it with people and be open to criticism are my three points. Excellent points. All right. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want to answer? Uh, ways that people maybe be able to get a hold of me, you know, the website, www.jvhilliard.com. It's pretty easy to find on Twitter, TikTok, and Insta, um, J at JV Hilliard books. And then on Facebook, I'm just regular old JV Hilliard. You can find me there. Uh, if, and if you, uh, you want to reach out to me, I am not shy. If you can't tell, I will respond to emails within 24 hours. If you instant message me, that's totally fine. I've, again, I got a, I got a thick skin, you know, uh, my day jobs created that over the last 20 years. And so I'm pretty, you know, pretty good at that. So I don't, I don't mind criticism, but I really like to, to, to know what you think about the novels when you read them. All right. Follow up question. What are you doing on TikTok? It's a slog. I am not good at the video thing. So, but I understand that a lot of people are migrating to TikTok. And so the concept is to continue to create video content that people will watch in consumable bites that's relevant. So the the 
the algorithm theory behind it is to follow people that are having reader watch parties or other authors or other readers um, because they'll follow you back. And then to be, again, vigilant in creating content, not just the 140 doing. I, I look back and I realize how much I struggled when I first got into working with Twitter. It's just not my personality to be on social media all that much. Uh, and now that's gone from me typing, which I'm really good at, to me doing videos, which I don't want to do, <laughs> you know, and so you got to find things to make other videos. So I use it to advertise my appearances and where I'm going to be. I, you know, will offer advice on it. I will respond to other people. So it's just another venue through which people are seeking, you know, you know, to, to, to do their, you know, to spend their, you know, entertainment dollars. And I hope that they find me and, and buy my books through it. I've never been on TikTok, not TikToker. Uh, I'm a marketing coach. And the fact that I haven't embraced TikTok. Uh... <laughs> uh, I, I, I've gotten there because I've been beaten down. I, I was I was like you. It's like, oh, I, don't, I don't want a Facebook page. I've never been on Facebook. And now you realize that you've got 2,000 people following you on Facebook. And I've got almost 9,000 people following me on Twitter. It's free advertising. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're the ones that they're following you because they well, want to read. How many are following you on TikTok? I don't know, a couple hundred maybe. You know, I just started it maybe two months ago. So I got to build that up. In fact, if you give me a second, I'll tell you. <laughs> that's the, that's the, the value of doing that. Yeah. Well, because because um, if you've got 9,000 people following you on Twitter, then that's where you should be. That's well, that's right. But a lot of people are now migrating away from Twitter and onto. I, I can't get on it without it being loud. I don't know how to shut it off. So, uh, yeah. But I am on Twitter. I'm already there. And I'm taking this to content that's there and I'm making it into pictures for Instagram. I'm making it into videos for TikTok. Uh, you know, I'm likely going to start a Discord channel. There's plenty of other places I can be too as part of YouTube. I have a, a show that I have called The Realm, which I released through my website and through my, my uh, you know, my social media stuff, which is something very similar to this. It's about 10 minutes long. Uh, very digestible videos uh, for folks, and I and I bring on other artists and creatives uh, to be to come on the show and talk about their stuff. And you know, that's the kind of stuff I'm generating, and I'm hoping that generates a large enough audience. Uh, so, advice as a marketing coach: pick one or two, and and stay in their lane, and then just give tertiary posts that lead back to the other on the other platforms. Yeah, you know, that's that's probably sage advice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of you, run, you can run ragged and do a lot of this stuff. And so. you told me that you're open to cr constructive criticism. I am. <laughs> See how well I took that? <laughs> okay. This is my favorite part of the interview. It's also kind of the saddest part because it means the interview is over. But please share your moment of gratitude for whom or what are you most grateful? So it's my uncle, right? I mean, I mentioned him at the top of the show. I'll mention him at the end of the show. Um, if it wasn't for the time he spent with me, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I wouldn't have played Dungeons and Dragons. I would not have developed a writing and communication skill at a very young age and translated into a very successful professional, uh, you know, tool that I've used to, to build my businesses. And now coming full circle back to authorship, being able to memorialize some of the games we played 30 years ago, you know, or 20 years ago and, and taking those characters and bringing them to life in a way gives him a level of immortality. And so I'm very grateful for the time he spent and, uh, you know, the bond we had before he passed. Thanks for joining us this week for Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast, helping micropreneurs find your micro influencer magic. Your time is valuable. And I am ever so grateful that you chose to spend your time with us today. Be sure to check the show notes at gratitudegeek.com episode 129 for links to all the groovy resources mentioned today. And of course, to connect with JV Hilliard. And while you're there, why not subscribe to the show on Audible's iTunes, Stitcher, or any of your favorite podcast players. Our theme music is Trek 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. I've been your host, Candice Rodarty. Join me on my mission to spread gratitude. So seeds of appreciation and harvest a bounty of generosity and kindness. Stay groovy, my friends. Stay groovy, my friends.